welcome to today's webinar. My name is Julie Petty and I work with Meat and Livestock Australia as the Goat Industry Development Manager. Uh, before we crack on with today's webinar, I just wanted to go through a couple of housekeeping rules. <coughs> and I should apologise that I have a pretty yucky cold at the moment, so sorry that I sound a little bit croaky. Uh, but today's webinar, I'll just remind you, is going to be recorded. The webinar will be uploaded to the MLA website, uh, so you're welcome to go back and view it at any point in time. And following on from today's webinar, I will be circulating to everyone who's registered a link to where you can go and watch the recording and some additional information if you'd like to follow up on anything. In terms of uh, listening into today's webinar, there are a couple of different audio options which are available to you. Uh, the automatic setting will most likely be listening through your microphone and speakers on your computer. However, if you have any dramas whatsoever in, in sort of listening in or, or the sound isn't very good, you're very welcome to change over and use your telephone. Their phone numbers uh, and access code in order to do that are up on the screen at the present, uh, but they are also on the control panel for the webinar program, which should be on the right-hand side of your screen at the moment. Uh, and if you lose all of that, they are definitely in the email you would have received when you registered for today's webinar. I should mention that just to help keep the background noise down and so forth, all of uh, the attendees today are, have been put on mute automatically. So if you require uh, or you have a question that you would like to ask the presenter or myself at any point in time through today's webinar, you're very welcome to type those questions into the questions panel, uh, which you should see in your control screen for the webinar. And you should just be able to expand that and uh, you'll see that there's a text box there and you can type in your question. Very welcome, as I said, to do that at any point in time throughout the webinar. Uh, now, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker for today. So Emma Rourke works with the Livestock Biosecurity Network. The network is national and there are um, support offices in each state across Australia. It's funded through peak industry councils such as Sheep Meat Council, Cattle Council and Wool Producers of Australia. Essentially the network exists to provide information and support to producers around the issue of biosecurity. What we're going to be talking about today is, um, is some information which may be of use to you uh, in terms of how to put together a biosecurity plan for your property, why that would be useful, why that should be a priority and what value that's going to add to your business. So Emma, if you're ready, what I'm going to do is just change over the, uh, the control screen to you and then you can begin your presentation. Thanks Julie, let me know when we're ready to go. Just seeing a little bit of a delay, sorry. Okay, uh, the slides are up on the screen now. Great, thanks a lot, Julie. Uh, and thanks for the introduction, that saved me, <laughs> saved me <laughs> some things. So, uh, yeah, my name's Emma Rook. I work for the Livestock Biosecurity Network. Just a little bit of background, I graduated as a vet a few years ago and worked in mixed animal practice for a few years. And then um, I uh, spent a couple of years in, uh, uh, in Canberra in Department of Agriculture, so really got to understand how what happens on farms sort of impacts our um, sort of trade relationships and uh, also worked for Animal Health Australia for a couple of years, so I got to see how the, the national animal health programs get um, you know, managed uh, across you know, sort of our federated system and most recently working here with LBN in South Australia 
uh, working with producers on um, managing, sort of raising aware, aware, awareness around biosecurity and helping, uh, you know, give producers tools to help them manage their biosecurity risks. So, um, uh, so without um, further ado, um, uh, Julie mentioned who we are. We're funded by the Peak Industry Councils, and basically they identified that um, although there's an increasing awareness that biosecurity is important um, at sort of the national and um, sort of peak level, um, producers um, needed some support to understand how that actually one impacts them on farm, but two, um, you know, how they could practically make some difference to their biosecurity risk on farm. So um, basically. Um, uh, you know, as you know, um, biosecurity, uh, uh, we can look at biosecurity at different levels. So, for example, this uh, little guy here is a quarantine dog and you might see him at the airport. So, you know, that's sort of national biosecurity, uh, or biosecurity played out at a national level. Um, this is a fruit fly and um, South Australia has, you know, regional biosecurity around this um, pest and that, you know, helps with preferential trade for um, the fruit from South Australia. Um, this is a, a sale yard and if you sold animals through sale yards you'll understand that um, uh, at that there's biosecurity measures in place to sort of manage risks around these sorts of congregations of animals. And then what he, we're here to talk to you today is around sort of farm biosecurity which is something you can really, uh, you know, uh, have direct influence on and, and um, have impacts at a, a very local and personal level. And it's around managing the risks of pests, diseases and weeds, entering, establishing and spreading on your farm. So it's really about um, sort of keeping things out, keeping things in um, or, and, and sort of minimising the impact of those, um, those diseases, pests and weeds. So why is biosecurity important? Uh, these dramatic scenes are from uh, foot and mouth disease in the UK in 2001 and um, foot and mouth disease entered the country probably through swill feeding of pigs. Uh, the pigs were in the south uh, east of the country and somehow the disease moved from uh, the piggery in the southeast into a sale yard, a sheep sale yard in the northwest and um, those um, sheep that were exposed to the foot and mouth disease uh, mixed with a bunch of other sheep in the um, sale yard up there and then the disease was spread um, pretty much all over the country from sheep that were sold out of that sale yard. And the importance of something like foot and mouth disease is um, that huge, causes huge economic, uh, social, community and obviously health um, impacts. Um, in Australia, if we had um, something like foot and mouth disease, uh, we find that it would shut down our market um, overnight and um, because we've got such, you know, we've got such good preferential treatment um, in international trade because of our high health status in Australia, we'd be losing those really high value markets and because it would take us a while for those, um, uh, for us to uh, re-access those markets as we sort of get rid of the disease and then prove to other countries that we're free. Um, this will end up costing us um, not only sort of millions to eradicate but billions in lost trade. In fact, we may not ever get those preferential markets back if we're um, locked out of trade for any significant period of time. So um, in the UK we saw, you know, it was devastating economically but also, you know, we found that these communities were really, um, you know, pushed because those billions of dollars in lost trade actually, you know, are really, um, you know, individual producers, businesses that are being damaged. Um, on a more local level, this is just um, an example of, uh, of um, 24 hours of movement, um, livestock movements in um, Victoria. So if you look at um, uh, the blue lines, they're um, animals coming from farm into sale yards and if the red, you look at the red lines, they're um, animals moving out of sale yards um, back into the um, sort of uh, livestock community. So, I mean, if that's a 24 hours, so it really gives you some um, idea of, you know, if we got um, sort of a disease outbreak in um, in uh, Australia, how quickly potentially a disease like that could move. But it's not all about um, emergency animal disease, such as foot and mouth. Um, what we're here to talk to you today is about how, you know, you can manage your everyday biosecurity risks on your farm. and. 
um, these arguably uh, cost you and, and Australia more on sort of a year-to-year -year basis. So, um, so um, just in this picture, we've got a few different things. Um, you know, the top left is a, a louse, a sheep louse. This little guy on the left hand, lower left, um, that's a sheep with foot rot. So um, he's sore and, and he can't, um, you know, walk around properly. Um, uh, the fox is representative of uh, obviously some of our feral neighbours, and uh, and um, you know they carry a bunch of with um, with them. And you know, the one on the bottom right, that's um, you know a, one of our nasty weeds. And so. Um, just to think, when we think about biosecurity, um, you know, our um, uh, sort of, you know, we're thinking mostly, uh, LBN is thinking mostly about um, livestock, but, um, you know, when you're looking at a whole farm enterprise, obviously it's not just your livestock, it's pest risk, it's weed, weed risk. You know, if you're doing sort of cropping enterprises or horticulture, there, you know, there are going to be risks to those um, enterprises too, but the, um, you know, the, um, the sort of management uh, steps you put in place are the same for all of those things. So what's the point of biosecurity? Basically the um, biosecurity is about the safe movement of um, product, animal, people, vehicles, equipment, etc. and um, effective response to, um, to um, pest or disease incursion. And that, that what, basically um, there's no way we can reduce or, or make zero risk. Um, you know, the only way we could have zero risk in Australia is to you know, lock our borders or in your case, you know, lock your farm gates. No one comes on and off, you know, but then even if you do that, you've still got risk of, um, you know, birds and, and feral animals and, you know, weeds blowing over the fence. So there's no such thing as zero risk. So what biosecurity does is a good biosecurity plan is we're looking at reducing the risk. So we're looking, okay, so, you know, if we're moving vehicles around um, from farm to farm, how can we do that, um, you know, without but to, to reduce the risk of moving, you know, disease uh, and weeds uh, with with us as we're doing our sort of normal farm activities. And then if something does um, happen on, on our farm, we need to be able to pick that up really early. So we need processes in place to be able to detect something that's changing on our farm, um, investigate like what, you know, what co what's causing that. And then because we picked it up early because we've got a good biosecurity plan, we could act on it early and then um, sort of limit the impact. So what are the impacts of poor biosecurity? Um, you know, there's potentially um, economic I impacts are probably the main one we think about. But in the foot and mouth disease in the UK, um, we saw that there were also um, fairly significant um, social and community impacts. But even on a um, sort of smaller level, if you're um, spending the weekend turning lights in, instead of, you know, going to your um, son or daughter, even footy game then, that's going to, um, you know, impact your family and you know your your um, life, your lifestyle. So, um, so for example, for diseases, uh, we could be looking for livestock diseases. We could be looking at lost productivity, so reduced weight gain for something like lice. We could see damage to your wool clip. Um, we're looking at cost of treatment. So, not only the chemicals that you might be used to treat those things, but also the time, and maybe you need to employ labour to help you out. Um, the time to treat isn't just the cost, it's also uh, not just a monetary cost, but also as we discussed, you could be looking at social costs as well. Um, some diseases, and particularly weeds and pests, can be really difficult to eradicate. So, you know, there's some consideration of, um, you know, if we're putting something in place to prevent these diseases, even though it might be a little bit of effort, the effort of eradicating if it comes on is, uh, you know, much more significant. Um, at a broader level, we might be looking at your ability to access certain markets. So if you've got particularly, um, you know, uh, diseases in your livestock, then they may impact what sort of markets you can sell to. And you know, if you've got um, uh, a reputation that you've built around your personal brand, um, then you know that can be impacted too. And lastly, and it shouldn't be overlooked, um, you know, these sorts of uh, you know impacts. Um, can really, uh, these sorts of diseases, pests and weeds can impact your well-being, not just your well-being but also the welfare of your animals. So um, just moving on, um, basically, um, you know, the reason we have a biosecurity plan is it's your best defence against these sort of livestock pests and diseases. And although uh, it's not always going to be easy to see the benefits straight away, as soon as you make a change to your management, the return you get is going to be immediate. So if you're putting something in place to prevent 
or reduce the risk of something happening. Although um, you won't see it happen, uh, you know, it's hard to measure um, the benefit of that. You'll, you um, will almost certainly have reduced your risk of, um, of having that sort of, uh, of uh, that outcome. So we're reducing the risk of disease int introduction. And as we said before, if you, uh, you know, monitoring your flocks, you're going to get um, really good um, or quick pickup of um, problems and minimise the losses should you get a disease event. And I think the key thing here is that, you know, prevention and early intervention is much more effective and less costly than treatment. So um, moving right along to sort of getting into a bit more detail, um, what do you need to do to prepare an on-farm biosecurity plan? Um, something I didn't put on here um, is that um, really before you even start, you need to have a goal. Like what are you actually trying to achieve? You might have a particular pest, weed or disease that you're trying to, um, you know, trying to prevent. Or you might have a combination of um, different uh, risks that you're trying to manage. Or you might have something already on the farm and you've got to think about, okay, how are we actually going to um, sort of work our way out of this? Are we going to go for a management plan? Are we going to go for eradication? And that's um, sort of a whole other issue. But, um, you know, but a good biosecurity plan will actually help you move towards achievement of those goals. Um, really, you need to look at what, what are your risks and we'll go into each of these in more detail. And your risks are what sort of threats are there in the way of diseases, weeds and pests to your farm. But also something to keep in the back of your mind is, um, you know, welfare. So a lot of these, um, you know, a lot of these uh, uh, risks actually uh, impose a welfare uh, impact on your animals. And on top of that, there are um, additional welfare risks that might not be biosecurity risks that you sort of need to think in the back of your mind. And using this sort of structure, of biosecurity planning structure, you can kind of actually incorporate those in there too. And uh, if you identify a particular welfare risk, you can use the same sort of process to manage those. When you know what your risks are, or you think you know what your risks are, you need to prioritise those risks and start planning. So you might find that there's specific um, you have specific concerns which are either based on where you live or the kind of business you run and they're going to be more of a priority um, over uh, you know, other risks that um, may be in your environment. And we'll go into that in more detail. You need to identify steps that you're going to take to address these risks and then the most important obviously is to take action. And it's great to have um, thought about all these things but if we don't um, take the first step then you know, we're really just um, not changing uh, our risk profile, which is what we're about. We're trying to reduce, you know, reduce the chance of these things um, impacting our, our business. And the last one, um, but again really important, is monitor and review. We all live in um, dynamic environments and um, first of all we need to be looking at, um, you know, what we're doing and whether it's fit for purpose, but also looking at our environment and how's that changed since we set up our um, our uh, biosecurity plan. So just in a bit more detail, you know, what are your risks? What are you most concerned about? Where are your risks coming from? So uh, we'll go into a bit more detail, but um, some of the things you could think about it are, um, you know, you, you'll all have good local knowledge. No doubt you're talking to your neighbour or you're down, you know, at the post office and talking to um, people in the district. Local knowledge is a really good way to understand um, you know, what's happening in your, in your neighbourhood. Um, but not only that, uh, if you do have specific concerns, then just learning a little bit about those things. So for example, if you're concerned about um, you know, pesky virus or CAE or you know, um, foot rot, say, find out about the disease. Like what does it look like if it comes into your flock? Are you likely to protect it? Um, uh, you know, what sort of clinical signs are there and, you know, how is it spreading in the, um, you know, the livestock population. Those sorts of things will give you, um, really give you a um, heads up on, um, on uh, you know, making some decisions on management. Um, not only that, um, I just put this in here because I think it's a really good uh, way of understanding um, the way your livestock interact uh, with what's going on around around them. If you can think of um, the fire triad, so we all know that to have a fire we need heat 
uh, fuel and oxygen. And we know that if we don't have one of those, then um, fire doesn't occur. And this disease triad is the same. So our host is our livestock. Our agent is a sort of infectious agent that could be um, a disease agent or it could be a plant or a weed. And the environment is how those, how you know that impacts on both the host and the um, and the uh, agent. I really like this diagram here because it shows us that um, it's the host and the environment, or the host and the pathogen, are there, um, and uh, the environment's not right. Disease isn't going to happen. It's only when these three things overlap here in the centre that we're going to get disease. And I think this is useful to keep in mind because there's going to be situations where um, uh, you know, unless those three things um, are in place, we're going to get disease, and that provides insight for us on how we might manage those things. So, um, for example, um, an example, um, particular one that we can control is the host. So, for example, um, if you've got um, sheep, you probably don't have to worry about um, pesky virus because that's a cattle disease. So, um, and and the age of the animal might, so the species of the animal impacts um, the potential for disease. The age of the animal or the susceptibility of the animal might impact the disease. So that might be age or the sex. So for example, um, young animals are much more predisposed to getting sick from worms than old animals. So the age of the animal is going to impact. And also something that might impact the host is um, you know, what their level of immunity is. So have they got immunity to this disease? And that might come naturally over time, like worms as animals age, or it might be something, some intervention we've made, so something like vaccination, for example. So um, when we're thinking about what, where our risks are coming from, uh, I find this useful. It's very, very simple, but um, you might want to think about sort of what's coming onto your farm, what's leaving your farm, what's happening on your farm, and how your farm interacts with the environment. So if we just break that down a bit, the sorts of things that um, could come onto your farm. So if you're bringing livestock onto your place, so for example, um, you know it could be just one ram a year. Um, livestock coming onto your farm, and that's going to be, um, you know, there might be risks associated with that. What about um, your neighbours' animals? Um, you know, they're um, probably <laughs> environmental risks. If you've got animals straying across a fence line, you know they're going to be, uh, you know, affected with farm inputs, I suppose. Um, but other things like what uh, kind of people or vehicles or equipment are coming onto your place, and uh, are you importing feed? So, for example, um, you know, if you've got contractors coming on to do things, if you're importing hay because it's been a really rubbish season, then you know there's going to be disease and weed, weed risks associated with that. Similarly, what's leaving your farm? Are animals leaving and, what, and why are they leaving? Are they leaving to go straight to the abattoir, in which case their risk to others, others is going to be quite low, or are they leaving to go on to other, you know, into other flocks or herds? And so you know, that obviously the risk profile of those two situations is different. You know, um, are you, uh, do you have vehicles or tractors or whatever moving between parcels of land? You know, and what sort of risk does that pose? Um, you know, by taking uh, one uh, equipment off uh, one piece of land and, and putting it onto another. Um, and what sort of products are leaving your farm? You know, are you exporting hay? Exporting? When I mean that, I mean is it leaving your farm? Um, you know, what other kinds of um, products are, are leaving? From the management point of view, um, there's so much in there. But just some examples might be, you know, how do you manage your pasture? How do you manage um, your lambing or your kidding or your calving? For example, we know that um, you know we can intervene at the um, calving or the kidding um, points to uh, sort of manage diseases like Yoni's disease and CAE. Um, what sort of strategic animal health treatments are you doing? Are you vaccinating? Are you doing worm egg counts? Uh, you know, are you doing strategic worming? So those sorts of things will, you know, fit into this sort of management activity. And lastly, how does your farm interact with the environment? So have you noticed, you know, feral pests around the place? Where does the water water move on your place? You know, do you when it rains, do you get water moving uh, in from? You know, do you have creeks or lakes? 
and where does that water come from. Uh, so there's some things to think about. So we'll go into a little bit more detail on those ones. Um, so if we look at, um, this is, uh, sorry, by the way, these manuals are, can actually be found on the Farm Biosecurity website and I'll give you that um, resource at the end. This manual here um, is really put together by the livestock industry to help you, the producer, get, um, you know, sort of break this stuff down. It's quite a, um, you know, there's quite a lot to it, but um, if you break it down into pieces, then it becomes a lot more straightforward. And the other thing to, to note is, um, you know, you guys are already doing a lot of this stuff already. So you, you're not going to be developing a biosecurity plan from scratch. You'll be using these tools to actually help you identify areas that um, might need a little bit of improvement. So I'd imagine most of you have got fencing. I'd imagine most of you, you know, are looking at, um, you know, what where your feed's coming from. So just to note that, um, you know, those, uh, you know, this is really about how you can look at what you're doing and identify risks or gaps. So um, with livestock, you need to think about what the source of the livestock is. So one. Um, or what the risks associated with the source are, and one um, good way of doing that is by using an animal health statement. Animal health statements are available on most of the Department of Primary Industries website, but also on the Farm Biosecurity website, and I'll give you that later. But it's a really good tool. It asks a lot of questions around um, disease status, biosecurity, um, you know, introduction of animals, and uh, it's a very good tool to use to. Um, know what the right, if you like the right, or some of the right questions to ask when you're purchasing livestock. So um, livestock are probably one of the bigger risks of bringing disease onto your place. Chances are you're going to be bringing on the same species that, that you already have and you know they may be um, you know, harboring disease and you might not even know it. Not every disease makes an animal look sick. So um, um, the second is people, vehicles and equipment. Who's coming onto your place? and why are they coming? So if Aunt Mavis is visiting from the city and she's uh, just coming for, in for, into the house for a cup of tea, she's probably pretty low risk. But if you've got um, you know, a contractor who's just um, done some crutching down the road and he's got a couple of hours up his sleeve and he, you know, he's going to come and give you a hand um, with your crutching, then you know, chances are his clothes, his equipment, you know, unless he's done a really good clean down job at the last place, you know, he's he's probably going to be reasonably high risk. Someone who comes to check the power poles on your land, they're probably in moderate risk. They have been farm to farm, but chances are they haven't had much to do with the livestock. So it's about looking at risk. Who's coming onto your place? Why are they coming? You might want to manage these sorts of risks by um, you know, um, asking people to um, come to the house before they come onto your place. So you can do that through signage, for example, the the farm biosecurity side, and just get people to come. You can make a record that they've been. Uh, you can also then communicate your expectations about what you expect from them when they go onto your farm. Um, okay, so uh, feed and water. Probably the main thing about that, if you're importing stuff like hay, you need to be thinking about weed seed. Um, but if you're in, if you're bringing um, uh, sort of process feed on, it's important to remember that um, ruminants can't be fed uh, meat products, so uh, or ram, restricted uh, animal material, and it's really important that pigs aren't fed, fed swill meat products either. So basically um, the only animals on the farm that should be uh, have meat products are um, probably the chooks and um, the dog and the cat I suppose. Um, but then in, in that respect you need to be careful that your livestock aren't accessing the cat food dog food or um, you know the chook food and that's why we're not allowed to feed chicken litter anymore to livestock. Uh, looking at pests and weeds, um, those sorts of things, you know, weeds are going to be difficult to manage on your own because often it's an environmental issue. Um, and that's where it becomes really important to work with your neighbours, um, regardless really of who they are. Um, whether that's you know the council, uh, the neighbouring uh, livestock owner. Um, you need to be looking at uh, working together on weeds and feral animals. Just a note on dogs, um, dogs can actually carry some diseases of livestock 
and also some of those diseases such as high dosage can actually impact on human health. So it's important to burn your dog monthly with a tapeworm to make sure that um, you know they're not impacting not only your animal's health but also your health. We talked a bit about animal management before. Um, part of animal management is uh, monitoring and surveillance of your livestock. So if you um, are monitoring your animals and you have reasonably close observation, you're going to notice a change. So, and, and the next step to that, of course, is that if you notice a change, you need to be following up on that. So if you notice a small change, you might monitor that for a day or two. But if you're noticing it's continuing or it's very dramatic, then um, you know, that might indicate that there's something going on in your flock. Um, don't forget we said that early intervention is going to be more cost effective than waiting for a disease outbreak to go right through your flock. So um, you know, get some advice, give the vet a call, give your local animal health officer a call and um, they may just be able to give you some generic advice over the phone or your animal health officer or vet might be quite happy to come out and, um, and have a look for you. There are disease um, investigation subsidies offered by most, most of the state government. So uh, if you are seeing something weird and wonderful, particularly, well not even something weird and wonderful, but an increased level of something in your flock, again, give your vet or animal health office a call and they can, um, you know, maybe um, they can provide you some sub subsidies for disease investigation. Uh, with some um, carcass effluent and waste management, uh, part of this is around strays. So if you've got um, sick animals, um, first of all you need to keep them away from your well animals. So if you've had an animal that dies, and particularly if you don't know what it is, you don't want your other animals um, sort of crowding around there and potentially getting sick also. But also stray animals can be dragging bits and pieces of carcasses around the place and um, you know, that can impact on, um, you know, can cause disease spread. Uh, similarly, uh, we haven't really talked much about residues, but uh, talking with a South Australian uh, chemical, rural chemical guy here in the state government and um, he said the most common residue they get in livestock is um, lead and he, you know, and, and most times they do an investigation it's because the animals have had access to the waste dump and there's, you know, batteries and old, you know, what are the old batteries really. So just be um, really aware of that sort of stuff that biosecurity we're talking mainly about infectious um, disease and weeds, but also residues that maybe cause an impact to you on your business as well. Um, the last two um, are actually probably two of the most important, but probably the least that get talked about. Um, if you've got staff, it's important to know that, that they know, um, you know about biosecurity and why it's important. If you don't have staff, um, it's probably uh, even more important for you to like upskill yourself on you know knowing what you're looking for and um, just practicing really good on farm hygiene. So um, yeah, particularly around staff, uh, if you're um, you might be full bottle, but if your staff don't understand why you're asking them to do something, they may not um, they may not do it because they may not see the under understand the importance or the relevance. Uh, on to record keeping. Um, Record keeping is really un underdone, or often underdone, but again, really important. Apart from the legal requirements to, around record keeping for um, you know, use of animal treatments like antibiotics, etc., um, really good records can help you detect subtle changes in your flock or herd, and that will help you um, again pick up sort of early outbreaks. So. Something like pesty virus, for example, in um, a cattle herd can actually be really subtle. We mostly hear about these nasty sort of what they call disasters or train wrecks where, you know, half the animals are bought. But actually what's more common is that we see, you know, we see just a slow decline in, um, you know, herd fertility or we start to see a few um, calves born and they just don't do that well and they don't live very long. Those sorts of really early subtle signs can help tell you there's something going on before you do end up with a train wreck. Um, so record keeping is really important. Um, the other reason uh, record keeping is important is if there is a disaster, you've actually got some records to go back and look at. So you might be able to detect what uh, caused it or um, whereabouts in the timeline it sort of is likely to have entered the herd. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's really important um, for you to be able to find out 
um, how you need to change your management practices into the future to prevent that from happening again. Um, in an emergency context, um, it's really important to, under, to know what's been on off your place in case there's a big emergency animal disease outbreak and that's really going to help get on top of it quickly and reduce the impact on the industry as a whole. Lastly in this section, um, we've also got contingency planning. So what happens if there's an emergency animal disease outbreak in, um, I don't know, Victoria and you're in um, southern New South Wales? Chances are that you're going to be impacted even though you're not in the same state. So how are you going to um, reduce the risk of disease coming onto your place? But also um, how are you going to keep going like with your normal business uh, in a context, in, a, in an environment where there is an outbreak? The other sort of contingency um, planning you might want to think about is disasters. And poor old Queensland's had a few of those in the last few years, particularly flooding. And um, think about how how how, you, how are you going to manage your place if, it's, if there's a flood. So those sorts of things we hope we never have to deal with them, but they're definitely worth putting into your planning. Okay. Okay. So we've talked about risks ad nauseum, um, and they, the reason I've been very general is they're going to really depend on on you. They're going to depend on your enterprise and the kind of person you are, and so will um, the way you prioritise those risks. So for example, if you're a breeding enterprise versus a fattening enterprise, that's really going to change um, the way, like so for example, AED is a good one. Yoni's disease, um, if you're selling animals to the abattoir, it's probably not a massive impact on your business. But if you're trying to sell stud animals out into the breeding community, into the commercial community, that's going to impact your business. So you might um, put a lot more um, uh, effort on managing JD if you're a stud versus a, um, a, a fattening enterprise. The other thing is we're all individuals and it's going to be up to you what's important and that'll depend on your values and also um, why you're running the enterprise, what you want to get out of it. And the obvious one is obviously time and resources. And then you need to identify the steps you need to take these risks um, to address these risks. And um, we don't have to do it all at once. <laughs> There's a lot to think about um, and you may be doing a lot of it already. So what's, what one, what's one small step that you can take this week? What's one that you're going to take in the next, say, six months? And what's one that you need to build into your financial sort of management and fences are one that always sort of needs to go in there because, you know, um, they're not cheap but they're an essential um, biosecurity tool. Once you prioritise your risks, um, take action. <laughs> so um, again, we talked about um, small steps. Um, just take one step at a time. So for example, you might decide that you're going to have one set of boots that you use on your farm and they never leave your farm. So when you get up in the morning and you go on farm, you wear those boots. But when you go off farm, you um, don't wear those boots. So those boots, for example, um, don't go out into the environment, they don't pick up weed seeds, they don't go into someone else's sheep yards and pick up foot rot uh, bacteria. You know, they're just a few examples. Another example might be weeds. You might be battling a number of different weeds, but pick your top I don't know, one or two or pick the group that you can manage at the same time and um, you know, work on those first. Work on the ones that are going to have the biggest impact on you or the, the more that that the small amount of effort you're, the effort you're going to put in is going to have the biggest impact. Another small thing you can do is think about um, signage. So it's amazing how uh, much impact a farm biosecurity sign has. Uh, it's big and red, it says do not enter, it's got your phone number on there. And, um, but it's important that if people ring you, you know what you expect. So if uh, they ring you, uh, you need to be able to say, yep, meet me up at the house or um, you know, you've got to make an appointment or you're fine to go on but can you please make sure that your vehicle's clean. Uh, whatever suits you, um, just make sure that you know what you expect of people. This um, document here, the Farm um, Biosecurity Action Planner, is kind of a useful one uh, for taking action as the name suggests. Uh, it has a list of, um, uh, it's, firstly it's enterprise it's whole of enterprise, so it talks not only about livestock but also about 
um, plant-based industries. And um, it really talks about, you know, what are you doing? Uh, yes, we're doing this. Yes, we need to do a bit more. No, we've got that covered. And it's just a bit of an um, extended checklist to help you have a think about you know, what you're doing and what you might need to. A really good um, tool for prioritising. And um, you can find that on the Farm Biosecurity website. And lastly on this um, page, you know, the best time to do something is before you've got a problem. So um, if you're not going to do it now, when are you going to do it? And if you're putting it off, why are you putting it off? So, you know, we all have to ask those hard questions about <laughs> to ourselves every now and then. And um, yeah, think about doing something, even if it's the smallest thing. Um, in the next say week. Uh, monitoring and review. Um, basically, um, this is something we all find, uh, I suppose, or usually drops off the list, but it doesn't have to be difficult. Uh, obviously, it's inappropriate to go through, you know, a large-scale monitoring and evaluation process of your um, farm biosecurity if um, it's just you and you have a, a fairly small enterprise. However, if you've got lots of staff working on your place or you've got, um, you know, multi-million dollar businesses, then maybe, um, you know, you do need to think seriously about, you know, proper monitoring evaluation process. So um, basically, a monitoring and review is what are you um, achieving, what is, what is your biosecurity plan set out in, setting out to achieve and are you achieving it? And if you're not achieving it, how do you need to change what you're doing to achieve what you're trying to um, what you're trying to achieve. When should you do it regularly? And that might depend on your business. I would say yearly. Uh, you know, a lot of biosecurity plans are just a two-pager. So it might be a checklist to say, yep, those things are still relevant. But guess what? You know, uh, you know, tyleriosis has been um, found in southwest, southeast Australia in the last 12 months. How does that change my risk? Does it change my risk? It might not. Or it might change my risk, but there might be I might decide that uh, I won't do anything about that. So um, review your plan regularly and um, at a regular intervals, but also when there's a change in risk. Um, and yeah, keep it simple. You don't need to go. Um, you know, you don't need to employ a <laughs> monitoring evaluation company. Um, just just um, just sit down one evening and just have a look. Okay. These are, I know we're going on a bit, so we'll just keep this really simple. And you, you'll have this presentation um, after the um, webinar, but I just wanted to go back a step and think about the key principles of biosecurity. Um, I've broken these down. So biosecurity is a continuum. Your, um, the farm gate is the border, right? So what's happening pre-border or outside your farm gate impacts on your biosecurity risk at the border. And then what's happening on your place um, obviously, um, you know, is uh, going to impact your, you know, all those things we said before, productivity, social welfare, those sorts of things. But what's happening on your place then impacts your neighbour. So biosecurity is a continu continuum, none of us are an island. And so, um, you know, it's important to think about biosecurity risk as a continuous, not as a, as a sort of a, as, a, as an island. So the reason um, I told you that is that um, the best way of managing biosecurity risk is pre-border. So if it's not coming onto your place, then um, you know uh, the risk is much better managed before it gets to your place. And equine influenza is probably a really good example of how, um, for whatever reason, the risk wasn't you know managed before it got to Australia's border. But then at the border, that's where that risk should have been managed. But somehow you know it sort of escaped from the quarantine station. So um, you know, if those horses didn't have equine influenza when they came into the quarantine station, then there would have been no chance of it getting into the Australian horse community. Working together is much more effective than working alone. And this is why the NRM guys, um, you know, do a lot of stuff on, you know, regional weed control. Um, because um, if you and your neighbours um, or your district are working together, um, then you can get a much better outcome. My understanding is that there are, um, you know, there are groups of producers who've gotten together and um, and tried to say be free of lice for that area or free of ovine brucellosis for that area. And what that means is that if you know all your neighbours are um, free of lice or ovine brucellosis, that reduces that reduces your risk. 
So that's the benefit of working together. So the same goes for weeds and obviously feral animal control. Okay, prevention is most cost effective. And this just shows on the left hand side that if you, for every dollar you spend on prevention, potentially you get $100 return for that. The problem is it's hard to see. <laughs> um, it's much easier to, uh, once you see something, you can treat it and you can see that it's gone away. But uh, actually prevention is much more um, cost effective. Once something's entered, eradication is much more cost effective than having it in your environment all the time and managing it on a day to day, month to month, year to year basis. So basically the earlier the intervention, the more cost effective. Uh, clean in and clean out. Uh, it's really, really simple, a really simple concept, but basically, um, you know, if you can at least have your um, people, um, your, your boots, your hands uh, visibly, your, uh, your machine and your equipment visibly clean um, when you come onto your place, so you talk, I was talking mostly about contractors in that case, or if you've been on a neighbour's farm, you know, or if you're going onto a neighbour's farm making sure you're here is clean before you leave your farm so you're not putting your neighbour at risk. So this just shows that dirty boots have lots of bacteria when they plate it out onto the petri dish. Clean, just soap and water, clean or even water. Um, clean boots have a small amount of bacteria but much, much less than dirty boots and obviously disinfected boots are the best. But this is the benefit you can get from just washing your clean, your boots, your equipment, your vehicles, your hands from visible dirt reduces your risk by a huge amount. And obviously, you know, if our animals are, um, are um, well fed, so they're, um, they've got good body condition and they're low stress, so they're not, you know, running from, you know, running away from dogs um, every day. They're not, um, you know, they're, um, They've got good shelter in the paddock, so they're not um, freezing or overheating. Uh, you know, what, if you've got good, healthy animals, that's going to go a long way to prevent um, sort of disease. Um, not maybe coming onto your place, but the sort of impacts that it's going to have. Okay, so just in summary, um, you know, disease, pests, and weeds are out there, and they can impact our farming enterprises. Um, and a good biosecurity um, plan will reduce the risk of introduction of these things. But also, should they come in, it would reduce the impact should, should an event occur. I've specifically put uh, reduce the risk and reduce the impact. We're not living in a zero risk environment. If we want to be trading with our, um, you know, domestically or locally or internationally, we're never going to have zero risk, but we're looking at managing the risk to an appropriate level. And the best time, of course, <laughs> is to implement a biosecurity plan is now, at least um, before a disease outbreak. Or if you've got something you need to control on your farm, then um, you know the sooner you do it, the sooner you're going to see the benefits. And just a note: I mean, really, biosecurity is everyone's business. It's your business. It's your neighbours. It's the industry's business. It's the state government and it's the Australian government. So it really takes all those people to work together. And you guys are a key linchpin in managing um, biosecurity risk in your industry. Uh, so I think biosecurity, basically when you move in, anything, uh, when you have visitors and importantly when you're doing your farm budgeting or your business planning and also when you're talking to your neighbours. Uh, basically we want more healthy animals and less horrible, sick, unhappy animals and we want uh, you know profitable farmers obviously. Uh, here's some resources. Farm biosecurity website's excellent. It's um, very general, of course, but it's got some really good um, documents and places to start. LBN, we've got some on-farm biosecurity planning tools um, on there, so um, go and have a look there. Uh, your local department of primary industries will have good local knowledge on what's happening in your area, plus some, obviously, information. Um, MLA um, provides some really great, um, you know, sort of basic uh, tools for uh, flock and herd management and there's a biosecurity aspect in all of those. And Parabos website, particularly for sheep, but also the worm aspect is probably important for goats as well. Really, really good practical advice on how to manage um, live sheep and fly strike. Thank you for your time. Um, that's my contact details. Um, there's an LBN officer in every state, so please, please feel free to um, go onto the website and contact them if you 
like to discuss anything further. Thanks, Julie. Great. Thank you very much, Emma. That was that was excellent. Very informative. We've got a few questions coming through and I just encourage everyone, if you have any additional questions uh, regarding anything that's been presented, um, please feel free to type those into the questions panel um, on your control screen there. Uh, Emma, did you just want to bring your slides back up? I think we're just seeing the generic, um, you're, you're still the presenter at the moment. I thought I'd best leave you as the presenter just in case people want to refer back to particular slides and the questions. Um, so one of the questions was where do we get, where can we get access to or um, copies of those farm by security signs? Emma, have you muted yourself? <laughs> yeah, I have, sorry. <laughs> okay, cool. No worries. <laughs> uh, uh, the Farm Bio Security website um, has a page on the on the signs and uh, or you can contact Animal Health Australia or Plant Health Australia um, if you have a grain biosecurity officer in your state or um, you can contact us as well. So um, right. there's a few different ways. Are they, yeah. are they free or are they uh, purchased for a, for a small fee? Depends who you ask. <laughs> okay. um, Which ones are free? Order, yeah, well the grain guys actually are funded to um, have some, um, certainly in South Australia, the grain guys have um, some reserves so they can go there first probably. Animal Health Australia mm -hmm. has, um, it's $40 um, including postage. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, I should mention um, I have heard through some of the different networks at the moment that um, DAFWA, so uh, over in Western Australia, are offering sheep, uh, cattle and goat producers free autopsies uh, for a certain period of time. Um, so if you've got uh, livestock that are sort of passed away on your property and, and you're over in Western Australia and you're wondering what on earth might be the cause, that is a free service that's been offered and what I can do is uh, circulate some additional information about that in the email that we'll send out to all the attendees. Um, I should also, uh, there was a question that's come through Emma about um, working with neighbours and so forth. So I think this mm. is in relation to the, the comments that you were making about, you know, depending on whether you're breeding sheep to just send them straight through to the abattoir or whether you're, you know, more of a stud operation, you're looking to sell that stock back into the, the breeding um, population and your priorities being a little bit different with those, with those two different enterprise types. Mm. If you're beside mm. each other or like, I guess how how might um, you know you manage those kinds of risks? Um, you've obviously got to try and keep get your neighbours on board and get them up to speed, but obviously there's some challenges there. I guess. Yeah, there, I mean there are challenges. One of the you know obviously we're all individuals and we all run different sorts of enterprises, so that can be really difficult. Um, I suppose you know. Uh, the first thing would be to have a conversation um, with your neighbour about, you know, your priorities. Um, if, you know, and uh, and you know that's a really good place to start. Um, if there are specific um, issues you're having, obviously addressing those. But you know, if your neighbour isn't um, doesn't have the same priorities as you, then you probably just need to think about how you're going to manage those. Solo, if you if you like, um, mm -hmm. it's not ideal. But um, you know, for example, I know some people you know find some sort of shelter belts, or um, or you know, I know people who like won't put a certain type of livestock in a certain paddock because their neighbours you know um, are um, you know have a different sort of perspective on biosecurity. So there's a few different things you can do. The other thing you can do is. Um, Shelby and um, officers are really um, happy to facilitate some of those discussions. So, for example, you know, life is a big one here in South Australia, where you know, it really impacts, um, you know, stray animals are a really big problem. And uh, you know, if we can sort of get a discussion happening around it, then you know, people usually um, can come to a point where they can agree on a on a um, on a, a base outcome. So, for example. Um, you know, even if uh, 
they say, okay, well, life isn't really that important to me, but our neighbourhood's going to agree to share at the same time. So that reduces the risk, even though the neighbour might not be that interested in life. He's probably happy to say, oh, well, I'll share at the same time, and then it reduces everyone's risk. Does that make sense? There might be yeah. some creative ways of, of doing that. So, you know, you could have the one-on-one -on -one conversation, or you could use a facilitator like um, your LBN officer, or um, even you know your local department uh, uh, vet or animal health office can be useful um, to help guide those discussions as well. Sure. Uh, we've had another question come through regarding the proposed Queensland biosecurity. Um, so some changes that are being proposed and to be implemented in 2016. Uh, the question relates to the guide and will that satisfy the expected legislative requirements? So I'm, I'm assuming they're talking about the, um, the Farm Biosecurity Action Plan. Oh, okay. Um, you might have to talk to our Queensland representative. Sure. Um, there are um, requirements under some of the accreditation programs now, um, and mm -hmm. um, and I think that you know one of the other things is if you are part of accreditation programs, or you do need to have some level of um, auditable biosecurity for any reason, then um, you know it's sort of uh, they sort of fit for purpose for both, if you like. So you might have to yep. look at what's required under the Queensland um, requirements, and then um, you know basically go back to what you're doing now and sure. uh, where are the where are the gaps. But um, Sarah Jane Wilson is our officer in Queensland, and she'd be really I mean she'd be right across all that. She'd be really happy. Yep. So I can actually um, well maybe Julie, um, you've got. Um, Sarah Jane's uh, details are on the website, so uh, if you just go into LBN and then regional offices, she'll be able to help you with that. Sorry, I can't be more specific. No, no, that's fine. What we might do is potentially follow up, um, follow up that question with that individual. Um, right. Well, um, what we might do, I'll just change back to um, myself being the presenter, Emma, if that's okay. Yeah, of um, course, yep. Any. Uh, if, if anyone does have any additional questions, please just type those in, but otherwise we'll, we'll wrap up very shortly. Uh, I just wanted to mention um, that, okay, so we do have a number of other upcoming events and resources which may be of interest to some of our listeners. Uh, so these are on a variety of different topics. So the first that's listed there is a webinar of basically about funding your business and, and financial planning and so forth. And it's essentially about trying to ensure that, that you've got plans and, and processes in place as early as possible so that you're funding things like your own retirement, the kids' education, your own succession planning uh, with as minimal stress and um, sort of impact to the business as possible. And the webinar, this was a webinar uh, run by the, the Pastoral Profit um, Program through uh, MLA and NABWI, and it is an absolutely excellent webinar. It really makes, simplifies the whole process. So I highly recommend that um, that is uh, something people go and check out at a later date. There's also been a whole bunch of webinars uh, held by leading sheep in Queensland recently, which have included a number of topics around disease identification and treatment. Um, so those are all recorded and available on the Leading Sheep website and they might have some direct relevance to some of the topics that Emma's touched on today in, in her presentation. Uh, especially, you know, really important things like, you know, how you're going to identify uh, different um, diseases or issues within your herd or flock. Uh, and on the MLA website, this is obviously a webinar that's been run as part of a series we've been doing and there's a number of other uh, topics that have been recorded such as things like parasite control, uh, dog control, looking at exclusion fencing, that type of thing, uh, a live export update um, and those are all available to download uh, anytime you please on the MLA website. We've also got uh, the Goats on the Move e-newsletter, which is a quarterly um, update sent to all subscribers. It's available free of charge and includes information about latest research and development, producer case studies, what's happening in the marketplace. 
And there's also a number of free market reports that MLA produces, which are um, obviously free to subscribe to, and those are across species. So uh, if you're wanting any information about slaughter numbers or sale prices or anything like that for sheep cattle or goats, those are all available there. And uh, the information is not only up on, up on the MLA website, but if you email the MLRS um, email address there on your screen, uh, you can subscribe and, and get the email sent directly to your, your inbox. Or alternatively, there is a, a market um, reporting app, which you can download if you have a smartphone. Uh, well, that's really all from us today. I'd like to say thank you very much to Emma for, for uh, taking the time to prepare that presentation and share that with us. Um, if anyone has any follow-up questions, um, uh, you're very welcome to get in touch with either Emma or myself. I will be able to assist you after the webinar. And if you have any ideas or suggestions for future webinar topics, you're very welcome to get in touch with me directly uh, and, uh, and send through those ideas. Thank you everyone for your time today. I hope the webinar was of use to you and um, please, as I said, get in touch if you've got any questions or concerns following this. Thank you once again and we'll, we'll wrap up the webinar now. Thank you.